afternoon, everyone. I'm Amber Mace. I'm the Executive Director of the California Council on Science and Technology, and I'm grateful that you can join us today for our expert briefing on digital contact tracing. Uh, we are grateful also for that our panelists could join us and our moderator, Assemblywoman Jackie Irwin. Before I turn it over to her, I would like to tell you a little bit about CCST for those of you who don't know us that well. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit. We were created at the request of the legislature over 30 years ago to help make California's policies stronger with science and technology. And we do this through numerous venues. One is our expert briefings like we have here today. And this is a chance for us to connect experts from our network of expertise. These are our academic and research institutional partners throughout California. Uh, with you and with policymakers to answer pressing policy questions and have our experts provide uh, their, their perspectives and experts' opinions to you. We do record these webinars, so we welcome you to come to our website and check out today's and also web, uh, briefings that we've had in the past. We have a number of other ways that we connect science and policy. We deliver high impact peer reviewed reports and we have one coming out this fall on wildfires and the costs associated with them. So keep an eye out for that. You also may know us for our CCST Science Fellowship Program. This is a program where we place 15 PhD scientists and engineers in the legislature and the executive branch. And uh, they get to join us for a year of government service and leadership training. So these are the various ways that we connect science and policy and work to provide actionable science advice to decision makers in the legislature and the executive branch. So we're very happy that you could join us today to meet some of our experts and to hear from Assemblywoman Jackie Irwin. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our moderator, Assemblywoman Irwin. She represents California's 44th Assembly District. She chairs the Assembly Select Committee on Cybersecurity and co-chairs the National Conference of State Legislature's Task Force on Cybersecurity. Th these positions have helped Assemblywoman Irwin lead national and statewide efforts to improve our cybersecurity policies. She has a background in systems engineering. We love our engineers. And we are so honored that we were able to uh, have Assemblywoman Irwin be a CCST Emerging Science Champion for us in 2018. We we're very grateful to award that to her. So I would love to turn it over to Assemblywoman Irwin. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Amber. We are in unprecedented times and lots of effort is going into finding creative solutions to slow the spread of COVID-19. While contact tracing has been utilized for decades as a tool to slow the spread of disease, app-based digital contact tracing solutions have recently emerged as a potential supplement to traditional methods. Other countries have attempted to use digital contact tracing to get a handle on the spread of COVID-19 but the US so far has not widely adopted this technology. Google and Apple recently re uh, released APIs to support such Bluetooth based apps directly into their operating systems to allow for such digital tracing. With every advance we make toward creative solutions through technology, we must also consider what additional risks we are taking on. People have real concerns about balancing data privacy with working toward contributing to real answers. Some of the perceived threats may be mitigated through appropriate application of tech to well understood problems, while other perceived threats may be handled through smart policy and toward forward, forward thinking about precedent. Our panelists today are experts in different aspects of digital contact tracing, from knowing the technology benefits and limitations to understanding the real and urgent need needs of the public health experts, to thinking about keeping data private useful and considering whether everyone has the same access to good solutions. If you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we will get to as many of your questions as we can. So I'm first going to have our wonderful panelists introduce themselves and describe their expertise and we will start with Dr. Dan Bonet. Welcome. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really excited that this panel is taking place. So, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, so let's see, my name is uh, Dan Bonet. I'm a professor of computer science at uh, Stanford University. 
I work on cryptography and computer security. I've been uh, working in that area for, uh, for many years, almost over two decades. Um, I also advise COVID Watch, which is one of the exposure notification applications that just launched at the University of Arizona. Um, so exciting to see some of these um, exposure notifications already getting put to use. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for putting this together. Thank you. And, and next we'll move to Dr. Brandy Naneke. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really excited to join all of you today to discuss this important issue around contact tracing. I'll focus my remarks on security and privacy considerations, and especially looking at the deployment of these technologies from a human rights lens. Um, I'm Dr. Brandy Nanaki. I am the director of the Citrus Policy Lab headquartered at UC Berkeley, where we support interdisciplinary tech policy research and engagement with the goal of supporting evidence evidence-based policymaking in the public and private sectors. All right, and finally, Dr. Mike Reed. Hi guys, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, of infectious diseases at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, and in my pre-COVID life uh, was uh, involved with uh, global TV policy. Um, I'm the Associate Director of the Global Health Diplomacy Delivery Center at UCSF. But for the last four and a half months, I've been working for the Department of Public Health to, in San Francisco to help set up their contact tracing program. And I think I, I bring the sort of the programmatic lens to this conversation. What, is, what does manual contact tracing look like and how could these new technologies interface with the important work that departments of, of public health are doing across the country to reach contacts? Uh, all right, wonderful. Let's lay the groundwork here with some questions to Dan and Mike. Mike, uh, can you explain what traditional contact tracing does and how it works? Sure. As you alluded to at the beginning, you know, contact tracing as a public health intervention has been around for, for, for many years, in fact, the last 200 years or so. And it's an important way for us to, to, to reach people at risk for developing any infectious disease where we think that um, you know, making recommendations around behavioral change is important once they've been exposed. So in the context of, of COVID-19, uh, we have a disease that we don't currently have a vaccine for, um, and, and therapeutic options are, are, are not widely available. Uh, contact tracing represents one of the, the, the best public health interventions available to us. Quite simply, what it involves is uh, reaching out to the close contacts of individuals that are infected with COVID-19, recognizing that those close contacts are at greatest risk for developing COVID themselves, and asking those individuals to quarantine, to stay away from others, given that there's a risk that they may well develop the you know, signs or symptoms of the disease and therefore be infectious to, to those around them. It's not quite as simple as that, because um, asking anybody to quarantine for 14 days you know, requires them to take on social responsibilities. And, and so supporting them to be able to, to successfully quarantine also involves enabling them with appropriate social services resources, et cetera, so that they can fulfill the obligations um, and, and take on their shared responsibility within society. So, so that's sort of the, the, the basics of what contact tracing involves. I'm happy to go into more detail if that would be interesting to the audience later on. All right, and, and following on that, Dan, uh, what is digital contact tracing? Right, so I guess Mike kind of explained what the traditional manual contact tracing is. And digital contact tracing, actually what's called exposure notification is the, con the, the new name for this. So I'll just use the term exposure notification or EN for short. Uh, what that is, is a new idea actually that came, around, came out around uh, February or so. Uh, and the idea is basically to uh, use the cell phones that we all carry. I mean, that's kind of the new thing that, that's, that's now available to us. The population or large fractions of the populations actually have cell phones. And the idea is to use the cell phones that we all have with us to try and identify when people came in contact with someone who might be um, infected. And so I, I think it is kind of important to understand a little bit about how exposure notification works. So maybe, maybe I could just take a minute or two to explain the underlying technology and that will, I think will help ground the conversation. So the way exposure notification works is it uses uh, the short range radio on the phones. This is what's called the Bluetooth radio. So they have these Bluetooth signals only have a relatively short range, just maybe a couple of, um, couple of feet, couple of maybe tens of feet. Um, and what the way it works is effectively 
um, there's what's called a rolling identifier that changes every 15 minutes. So your phone basically has sort of an identifier that's uh, just a random uh, uh, collection of letters that doesn't really identify what the phone is. That random collection of letters changes every 15 minutes and your phone basically broad broadcasts that to uh, the people around you. Of course, this is all opt-in. So whoever is deciding to use exposure notification has to agree to turn this on on their phone. And once they agree to turn this on, the phone will kind of broadcast this to folks uh, that, uh, that are around, around you. So for example, you might be sitting at a restaurant or maybe you're sitting someone next to a bus and while you're, while you're there, your phone is constantly broadcasting these, these identifiers to the folks around you. The folks around you, basically, their phones will receive these identifiers and record them on their own phones, okay? Now, if later on at a certain point in the future, let's say uh, you become uh, infected, you're tested positive for an infection, what happens is you take all the identifiers that you have sent out to the world, let's say in the last 14 days, and you upload them to some central server. So again, these identifiers are just random letters. They change every 15 minutes. And before you upload them to the server, they have no connection to your physical identity. Once you upload them to the server, those identifiers now are identified as um, um, identifiers that belong to someone who is potentially infected. And the idea is that then everybody, um, everybody in the state, for example, would download these identifiers from the central server. This is what's called a diagnosis server. So all the phones in the state would basically download identifiers from these, this diagnosis server. I should say there are some optimizations to make this not so onerous, onerous in terms of communication. Um, but the point is once they download these identifier, identifiers, now they know, oh, all these identifiers are actually associated with someone who's infected. They can look at their own phone's records and see, did the phone ever come in contact with anyone whose identifier has been marked as infected? So the interesting thing is if you sit next to someone at a restaurant and that someone later turns out uh, to, be, to be diagnosed as infected, uh, then, um, then their identifier will be on your phone and your phone will alert you to say, yes, I, you have been in contact with someone who's infected and now you can take appropriate action. So maybe you wanna go get tested, maybe you wanna quarantine yourself. Uh, Mike can talk about the various actions that, uh, that people who have been warned about exposure uh, can take, uh, can take what actions uh, they can take. So that's kind of the idea that uh, voluntarily people will turn on this feature that once it's turned on, it broadcasts these identifiers to folks around you. Um, once you are identified as, once you test positive, these identifiers are, are uploaded to a central server. Everybody downloads the identifiers uh, of people who tested positive from the central server, and they can compare those to the identifiers that their phone recorded. And if there's a match, then the person is identified, then the person, the owner of the phone is warned to say you have been exposed, therefore exposure notification, and you should take appropriate action. One thing I'd like to point out though, um, is that uh, this idea is very recent. This is idea literally dates back to February or January, February or so. So it's really quite remarkable to see this being deployed so quickly. Uh, it's a very recent idea. And uh, what, uh, what's kind of useful to keep in mind is that, and again, Mike can talk about this later, uh, this is probably not the last pandemic that, the, that humanity is going to face, right? And so this technology, it's being developed now. Maybe right now it's not as effective because it's not as widely deployed. But probably we're going to be facing other pandemics in the future. Unfortunately, we're likely going to be facing other pandemics in the future. So it's kind of interesting to work on this technology now, make sure that it's available and um, you know ready to be used, so that it can be turned on at any time in the future when it's actually needed. So maybe I'll stop here, and we can yeah. continue the conversation. And and maybe we can have um, Mike or uh, Brandy add to that, and 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 also add in. Um, when you when we're we're talking about this uh, digital contact tracing, how how much what are the advantages of it versus traditional contact tracing, and what are the advantages of uh, uh, traditional contact tracing? Yeah, so so I can speak to to that question, um, Assemblywoman. You, you know, the, the the way things work right now is that when when a case is identified. Uh, one of my team reaches out to the case and and uh, asks them, who have you come into contact with? Who are your close contacts? More often than not, it's people in the same household. 
Um, and in that process, we're able to identify those at greatest risk for developing COVID who have been in closest proximity. And then somebody else on the team, often the same person, reaches out to those close contacts and alerts them to their need, their obligation to quarantine, given that they're at greatest risk for, for developing COVID themselves. It's a, it's a, a, a labor intensive process. Um, and requires a, a huge workforce. I mean, you know, estimates are that we need between 100 and 300,000 people doing the work of contact tracing across the US if we really want to respond um, uh, effectively to uh, the pandemic. The advantage um, of this approach is that, and this is something that we, we esteem to the highest regard here in San Francisco is that it's client-centered, um, it's empowerment-based, you know, and it's framed through an equity lens so that our, our resources are prioritized to reach those most marginalized communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. However, I do think there's an opportunity to leverage, you know, these digital tools. The question is how. Um, you know, I think, for example, you know, if they could be leveraged to support more efficient use of resources so that we can ensure that existing co contacts are, are, are more efficiently traced, uh, Im improve the accuracy of our contact tracing operations, and, and then enable scaling of our contact tracing efforts beyond, you know, the, the, the capability that we have now, then that, that, that all feels like, you know, valid reasons to sort of discuss this as a, as a potential added capability to our existing public health response. Uh, as Dan said, though, we're, we're in virgin territory. Um, there, there's no hard research data to inform this. If this was a, you know, a, a therapeutic intervention, you know, like Plaquenil, for example, we would require randomized control trials. And we don't have any hard research data to inform how best to leverage this Technology. Obviously, there are examples from other countries that we can speak to in a moment. Um, but you know that, that that that's one reason to pause and reflect on how to do this as well as possible. Brandy, over to you. Yeah, if I may, um, Mike, I'd love to hear more about your work with marginalized communities because some of the concerns that I'm hearing are that you know low-income households they may be sharing one cell phone. So then, does everybody in the household do they same do they have that same level of exposure notification? Um, and then also, of course, I know we have over an 80 percent uh, adoption rate of smartphones in the U.S., you know, a very high percentage. But there are still individuals who do not have these devices. So how do we make sure that those people are also included? One thing that actually I wanted to, uh, to just uh, uh, point out is that this is only meant to complement the manual contact tracing that Mike is working on. This is by no means a replacement. Yeah, this is just um, um, something that folks can, uh, that end users can choose to, to enable. And by the way, what's, what's really important about this technology is that exposure notification is only given to the affected individual. So there is no, the, the, um, uh, to the, the, so then the affected individual can decide what actions uh, they want to take. Maybe, for example, there, there are lots of stories out of Switzerland and Germany. They, they deployed a lot of these uh, applications and uh, what happens there when someone receives a notification, typically what they do is they just decide to go get voluntarily go get tested. So only the end user is notified and then they can decide what action they, they, they want to take. So that's, that's kind of where this is, where this is headed. But Mike, your, your, your point about uh, collecting data and seeing how effective this is, you are, uh, this is absolutely on, on target. Like you said, this is virgin territory, new technology just recently got deployed. And there's a huge amount we still need to learn about how effective this tool is going to be. Um, to, to Brandy's comment, if I may, Assemblywoman, I was, I was just going to sort of respond to, ar around the issue of equity. So I, I can speak from San Francisco, where this is an epidemic that has disproportionately affected you know, poorer members of the communities um, in the Latinx uh, communities, as well as African-American communities. And th th those are already populations that feel um, estranged from, from you know, public health infrastructure that are under or uninsured, um, already you know, uh, concerned about the, the, the stigma and, and the economic implications related to COVID. Um, and I think the, the, the challenge of leveraging a technology that sort of widens digital inequity as well as pre-existing health inequities are, are, are worth reflecting on. The other thing to say, though, is, it, you know, is, is more related to 
whether a technology like this that, that that doesn't have a human face that is not you know client centered that, that doesn't offer compassion uh, it will be as effective in those populations even if they do have access to smartphones who 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 really value having somebody who speaks to them on the phone and you know is able to explain inform and resource them we often say in san francisco that our contact traces we call to listen it's a it's a therapeutic intervention just making that call helping people understand what what is what what does being exposed mean what are their responsibilities and how can the department of public health facilitate them to be able to fulfill those obligations in terms of providing them with resources, et cetera. And I think, again, that, that, that's a question for me around how this technology will, will in, enable, enhance, or undermine you know, efforts to redress health inequity. Certainly, I can see the value of using this tool in wealthier parts of San Francisco, where, where people are going to act on the, the, the notification um, uh, information that, that may be afforded through a, 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 a smartphone. But I, I don't think this will ever replace the role of human contact tracing, particularly focused in those communities that have been disproportionately impacted, the you know, marginalized communities across California. All right, um, I'm gonna move on uh, to the next question. Uh, what type of data do public health officials ideally need to have access to, uh, to um, create a, a contact tracing app? And how can we prevent misuse of that data by uh, government? Well, Dan, I can speak to what data we need to perform the, the current functions of, of, of contact tracing. And maybe even before I tell you what the kind of data is, I think just underscoring the important principles of, of how we collect that data, because I think that should inform how we think about the data that's collected in an app as well. So first of all, you know, we, 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 we're really keen to minimize the amount of data that we're collecting on any given individual, no, no more than is absolutely necessary. Second, secondly, we really want to emphasize the importance of technical protections, you know, ensuring that data that we're collecting through the Department of Public Health is de-identified, is anonymized, and is encrypted. And, and so any you know, additional tool that supports contact tracing has to adhere to that same level of rigor. Um, and then I think the other thing that we esteem of highest regard is who controls the data, who, who has access to it, and is there a full transparency around that control process? So, so you know, concretely to your question, you know, we, we, we want to collect information um, from the cases, those individuals infected with COVID, about who they've come into contact with, the, their, their contacts, um, so that we can then reach out to the contacts and ask them, you know, very simple demographic information. Who, 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 where, where do they live? Who, who are they? What are their needs? Um, so that we can support them in, 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 in fulfilling the obligations of quarantine, 14 days in, in, in quarantine. So that's the sort of the, the simple data that we're collecting. Dan, I don't know whether you want to speak to the, the data that's collected through the application and how that's different. Um, yeah, so actually it's, it's um, so this is why this technology is not a replacement for, con for manual contract tracing. Obviously all the data that you need, Mike, is uh, data that's going to be continued to collect through uh, manual contract tracing. Um, the digital technologies, what they, they are actually focused on, at least the ones that Apple and Google are deploying, they're actually focused on not revealing uh, uh, user information. However, there is a way to, to collect uh, um, sort of aggregate statistics information um, about the about you know how many people are using the app and 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 so on. So there will be some some data that's available, but um, you know that's actually something that uh, as the technology evolves, um, you know we'll, we'll see exactly what the health authorities need and and um, what, you know what what they actually what they actually can get or not. So that's actually an active area that's uh, that's rapidly changing. So there, there's no so so most likely the, the data that they need will continue to come from uh, contract tracing, manual contract tracing that you're working on. Actually, if I, I just want to make one more uh, comment, which is on the accuracy of the of the data that's collected. I don't know if um, this is something that we're going to discuss later, but maybe I could just make make a comment on that um, quickly now. So Brandy actually made a really good point that um, phones are often shared. There are lots of other inaccuracies in this technology. For example, um, if you and I have come into contact, but both of us were wearing masks, that's not something this technology can measure, right? The phone doesn't know if we're wearing, wearing a mask or not. Or if you and I have come into contact, but maybe there is a wall between us, that's actually something that the technology might be able to measure because 
there's attenuation of signals through walls. Uh, but that's another potential source for inaccuracies. Yeah, so there could be lots of, there could be uh, false positives or false negatives here. Um, and again, all of that is data that, that will be collected over time and we will learn about the accuracy of these systems over time. But we know already and acknowledge that there's, you know, there's definitely inaccuracies in what's being collected. I'd like to comment a little bit on um, the second part of your question, Assemblywoman Irwin, uh, on the prevention of misuse of data. And we do have some data privacy legislation, especially in the state of California with the California Consumer Privacy Act that does provide some oversight in this space. For example, if a private entity is collecting data, individuals have the right to delete the data that's been collected um, and also to consent to that data being collected in the first place. We're also having a number of federal bills being proposed. Um, when I recently looked, there are about six that are specifically focused on this topic. And I think that there is some risk in having bespoke legislation specifically targeting COVID-19 uh, contact tracing. You know, instead, what we need is a more overarching federal data privacy legislation that will be able to accommodate these um, wide scale uh, pandemic issues that are going to continue to present themselves. As somebody said earlier, this is not you know the first pandemic, it's surely not going to be the last. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to carve out what, what are the appropriate data collection practices, what are the rights of individuals and in having their data collected, their right to delete that data, to opt in, opt out. So I think that that's a very important area where we need to focus a lot more energy. Yeah, and and maybe um, maybe we can hear from um, uh, Mike and Dan uh, kind of going further in that area. I think one of the real issues we're going to have to widespread adoption is the is privacy concerns. So, um, what sort of additional security issues or potential for misuse might we need to consider if this? Uh, technology becomes more widely adopted? And how do we convince people that we have put the appropriate um, security and privacy measures in place? Yeah, there, there are lots of issues that this technology brings up. You know, this is by, by no means sort of uh, solved problems. There are lots and lots of uh, uh, concerns that come up. And so um, let, me, let me bring up one issue that's, uh, that's been discussed quite a bit, which is the, the possibility of, of actually abusing the technology. And the, the risk that um, one has to consider here is what's called denial of service attacks, where the technology can be abused to make it seem as if someone is in, it has been exposed, but in fact they weren't. So maybe just to give like a, a simple example, um, if, so, if, if, I don't know, if some uh, malicious party wanted to shut down uh, a mail branch, just a, a post office branch, just to give a, you know, just a, a, as, a, as one example, they could in principle, um, uh, make it look as if all the phones in that post office branch have been in, have have come into contact with someone who is infected, and now that all the employees at the post office post office branch would have to go get tested and potentially quarantined. Um, so that's kind of a way for shut down someone to shut down the post office branch if they if they wanted to by abusing the system, and that obviously, I, I guess the election is on everybody's minds, and so post offices obviously are going to play an important role in the election, so it doesn't take much to, uh, to draw a connection from one to the other. Um, and so I think denial of service is a big concern that we, that we need to, to worry about. Um, and so the, in fact, the, uh, the, the people that, the, the, you know, the, the, the systems that are being deployed are very much aware of this denial of service issue. This is like one of the, one of the um, core threats that have been, that have been identified. And um, yeah, so not without getting too much into the technology uh, uh, weeds uh, into the weeds of the technology, I'll say there are ways to uh, to defend against these types of denial of service attacks. But this is still something that needs to needs to be done. Uh, in terms of privacy, I think it is really important to say that uh, the technology does need to be opt in, right? So I need to opt, so the users need to opt in to turn on the system in the first place. Once a user is tests positive the user needs to consent to having all those identifiers sent to the central server. Um, and so all the steps in the system have to be done uh, using, uh, using user consent. And that's actually where policy uh, policymakers really could, uh, could help make sure that this is really the case. And probably Brandy can probably talk more, a lot more about that. Yeah, I just wanna add what I think you know, are some 
necessary criteria are, I think, like Dan said, opt in. This needs to be voluntary. People need to be able to opt in or opt out. Mandated data minimization, that these entities are only collecting the data that is necessary for them to conduct the digital contact tracing or exposure notification, as I've learned it's now phrased, Dan. Um, sunsetting or deleting of the data after the pandemic. And of course, increasing transparency through collection notification. Um, so I, th I think those are some necessary criteria that need to be considered. What? You're muted, Assembly Member Irwin. Excuse me. In a couple of minutes, we're going to be going to questions from the audience, but let's see if we can just get a couple more in before that time. Could you talk about the complications that uh, could arise from a county by county implementation of a contact tracing app or a state by state implementation? Yeah, so th that actually is probably county by county is probably not going to, to happen in that um, there's sort of agreement that this either has to be done at the level of a country or the possibly the level of a state. Um, in fact, there's some, some effort in the US already to create what's called a U US national reporting server that would function as a diagnosis server for for the entire for the potentially for the entire country, but this might actually just happen at the state level. The problem with doing this county by county is a the technology providers Apple and Google don't want this to happen. They they would, don't want this to happen county by county just because of the additional complexity that's uh, that's that's going to be required. Um, so they they it's it's most likely going to either happen at the state or at the at the national level, um, and of course. Um, you, like, like we said, uh, the phones have to know which diagnosis server they have to go to to get the, uh, the notifications. So the fewer diagnosis servers there are that the phones have to go to, the more robust the system is going to be. So um, if we want to minimize errors, we'd like to have deployment kind of be done at, at um, the largest possible scale. So county by county is probably not an option for California. Okay, and then I'll just, get, oh, does, uh, I'm sorry, Mike? No, no, go for it, go for it. I'll, 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 I'll respond in a second. Uh, okay, and then um, just if you could really quickly talk about uh, the benefits and drawbacks of a centralized versus a distributed uh, decentralized technological implementation. Uh, sure, uh, actually Brandy might want to say more there, but uh, the decentralized implementations, which is what's actually being deployed today, uh, by in the Google and Apple systems, uh, those are are um, much give sort of control to the user much more than a centralized system will do, right? So the user can decide whether they want to upload certain data to the diagnosis server. The user can decide. The user is the only one. The consumer, the end the end user consumer, is the one that learns whether they were exposed or not, and they can then decide what action to take. That's that's what's coming. That's what's made possible by a decentralized system. In a centralized system, there is much more data that's being sent to a central server. Um, so as a result, there, is, there are much greater privacy concerns around central systems, centralized systems. Uh, fortunately, that's actually not the direction that these technologies are going. Most of them are going towards the more privacy preserving decentralized approaches. And Randy probably can say more about that. I just want to agree with Dan that the decentralized structure is much better. It has greater privacy preserving attributes built into it. And I'm happy to see that we're moving in that direction. I think it's important. Okay, and Brandy, can you just, um, again, before we go to the questions, can you just uh, uh, talk about any other equity concerns that you might have um, with the use of these applications? Yeah. And I, th I think we should also talk about some of the other technologies that are being developed around contact tracing technologies. I mean, even the digital contact tracing technology technologies or exposure notification themselves. I mean, individuals who need to utilize these technologies are being enrolled, for example, in order to return to work, that places a greater burden on those populations to be tested. And as Mike brought up earlier, some of these individuals are underinsured or not insured at all, lacking the ability to, you know, have access to the healthcare system like other individuals would have. 
also there's a risk of if individuals are required to do this. So for example, there's something called immunity passports where individuals can be tested if they have the prevalence of antibodies. And if they do, they can get this immunity passport that will allow them to, for example, return to work, travel. For those individuals, if work, they must go to work outside of the home, there could be a situation where those individuals will put themselves into situations of exposure to COVID-19 in order to get it. Uh, which raises some significant health concerns. I, I'm, yeah, I think those are some of the main points. There are two papers I'm going to actually post in the chat for the attendees. Um, one from Tiffany Yi. Uh, she just wrote a research report on. Um, let me just see the title here: Privacy and Pandemic uh, Law, Technology, and Public Health in the COVID-19 Crisis. I think it's an excellent summary of different technologies and the privacy and security concerns. I'll post that in the chat. And then also, I just wanted to give a quick plug for the Citrus Policy Lab. We have an affiliated scholar, S. Freeman, who will be releasing a report: Technologies of Pandemic Control, Privacy, and Ethics for COVID-19 Surveillance. So I'll post links to those resources in the chat for the audience now. All right, uh, thank you very much, Brandy. And um, these are, now I'm not sure who asked this question, um, uh, but uh, I think a lot of people would like to know the answer. What is the distance range in which uh, those around you receive the identifiers? And is there a possibility that it casts too wide or too narrow a net? And, you know, I think about being in, you know, in a, restaurants, does everybody in the restaurant get uh, notified at a certain point, you, have, you get too many notifications for anything to be helpful. And um, finally, um, um, is there any information provided about where exactly somebody is exposed? So all these are, you know, you're, you're sort of balancing with, you know, how helpful is this? And how much do you protect privacy? The, obviously, if you know where you were, uh, exposed, then you know who might have done it, uh, it po possibly if there was only one person in that place. So how, how do we balance all these things and, um, and, and what is the range? I think those are, those are great questions actually. So the range is uh, basically the Bluetooth range. So that's a couple of, that's uh, basically tens of feet. Um, so if you are sitting in a restaurant, yes, the, the whole point is that the restaurant, uh, people who are at the restaurant uh, will, get, will, will get the identifiers and, and uh, record them. Um, so that's as far as uh, the range is concerned. Now, when you are told that you were exposed to someone, the system actually, um, your phone actually knows where and when it received the identifier that caused the notification to happen. So in principle, the phone could show you the time at which the exposure happened in the location as well. Now, the the, the system itself that Apple and Google are deploying doesn't quite tell you, it, it actually limits the granularity in which you can get uh, the exact exposure time and notification. But in principle, the system could show you where and when the exposure happened. So uh, yes, there are some concerns about learning who caused the exposure, absolutely. Uh, but you know, that's, that's actually uh, what the system enables you to do. In some sense, you could say, well, you know, if, um, um, if you could tell where and when the exposure happened, maybe that also helps uh, you as an individual decide whether this was a serious exposure uh, concern or not. You know, maybe you sat someone next to someone on a bus and that actually, uh, if, if you are told that that's when the exposure happened, maybe that's actually a reason to actually go get, go get tested as a result. So in some sense, the, the decision on how to react to a notification is in the hands, in the hands of the end user, in the hands of the consumer. Uh, so you will get notified and it's completely up to you to decide well, what to do then. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, the range. Well, if you if you're if you're constantly getting notifications, I wonder what is what is the benefit? People are certainly not going to stay home and quarantine if they can't figure out where in the last 14 days they got the exposure. And maybe Mike has some to add to that about you know the contact tracing that we usually I, I mean, are using. I currently. mean, no, I I think that's a great point. The the operating characteristics, how sensitive and specific it is for accurately detecting real contacts is going to be crucial because it will inform whether people take this information seriously and act upon it. We know that in the SARS pandemic of 2003, there was an over quarantining of people. And I think over quarantining, asking people to, to stay at home too often, you know, will obviously lead to the kind of, you know, digital fatigue that you're speaking to Assemblywoman Owen, but, but more importantly has economic implications. We don't want 
too many people to be at home when the, when it was unnecessary. So so getting you know getting this right is going to be crucial because uh, as Dan alluded to, the onus is on the individual to to take responsibility for their own actions. Um, and I think that's the difference between what manual contact tracing involves, right? We we call people up. We tell them, hey, you've been exposed. These are the obligations of, of exposure in terms of quarantine. And, and, and you know, in lieu of that, on, a, on an app, we're expecting people to take action into their own hands and, and, and let their information be connected to the Department of Public Health, who can then reach them and offer them services, et cetera. Whether people will be willing to do that, I think, remains to be seen. All right, and then we have a question from uh, Landon Klein. And in addition to a CCPA, what other existing privacy schemes apply to data collected by these apps? That's a great question. And right now there's a lot. There's a lot of different data privacy legislation that, that could apply to this. And I think one of the biggest issues is that there's a lot of different rules and, a, and those rules apply differently to different stakeholders. Also, the US lacks a comprehensive data privacy legislation, legislation, which is why we're looking at the California Consumer Privacy Act. We're looking at HIPAA. When we're looking at the use of contact tracing within school systems, we're looking at FERPA. And you know, one of the biggest issues is how, how do we ensure that these different pieces of legislation are actually you know, carving out language that applies in this context? There's this gap in oversight over private sector entities, and I think this is the most problematic, especially in, re in regard to HIPAA. And as we see a flood of technological solutions proposed by private sector entities to measure and mitigate the spread of COVID-19, I think it's important that we make sure that the legislation that we have, you know, perhaps it's drafting additional legislation that reinforces some of those protections from HIPAA with particular requirements to the private sector. And there is actually legislation proposed to do this um, in the state of California. Those are important entry points um, right now. And I think what we're seeing right now is as we have this rush to develop these technologies to address the spread of COVID-19, we need to be conscientious that we're not rushing to implement solutions that actually infringe on individual civil rights. All right, and we have a question from Kendra Tully. How many people with phones would need to participate or opt in in order for exposure notification to be effective? And is there a way to follow up with individuals and ask which actions they decided to take? For example, did they get tested, quarantine, do nothing? Um, Probably a question for Mike. So, so it's a great question. Um, you know, in Singapore, where they're using Trace Together app, which is a Google developer application on phones, I think they they were hoping to get mass coverage, and I think they 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 thought that if they got more than thirty percent coverage, they would see a dividend. But I think even getting that number of people enrolled on the application was very challenging. The advantage of the GAEN um, technology here is that it will it will run in the background um, and won't interfere with battery life, et cetera. So, so some of that may, you know, concerns that were raised in Singapore may, may be obviated here. Uh, Dan, do you have anything you, you would add? Yeah, there? actually, so uh, again, technology companies are uh, quite aware that getting people, getting people to install the apps on their phones is uh, kind of a big hurdle. And so you've probably um, heard about uh, Apple making some uh, simplifying strides in that direction. They just launched uh, this exposure notification express system, which means that you can make use of exposure notification even if the even if even if you don't install an application on your phone. Um, and so you, again, all, everything is opt in. You have to agree to use it. But if you do agree to use it, you can actually make use of it without installing um, an explicit application. And so the, again, the technology is supposedly getting uh, easier to use and easier to install. Um, I, I think the question was, what exactly is the percentage that we need to have installed so that the technology is effective? I, I don't know that we have an actual number that, uh, that we can give. Okay, and what about the uh, follow-up questions? Can you repeat those? Uh, no, it, it's. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure if I heard you mention the the um, the question was: Is there some way to do follow up with the users what they did when they had a positive when they found out that they had had a positive contact? Um, 
Yeah, that's an interesting, that's a very interesting question. Um, so right now the end user is the one that learns whether they were exposed or not. And then honestly, it's kind of a voluntary process whether they want to tell someone that they got a notification or not. Um, I guess if they go to get tested, the uh, they could be asked, why are you getting tested? And one potential answer would be, well, my phone told me that I should go get go get tested. And then we could fall back into Mike's manual contact tracing uh, and take actions there. So the, again, the, the this system empowers the end user and the end user decides what action to take. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think along the same lines, my understanding is that if an individual is alerted to an exposure, then they could voluntarily inform the Department of Public Health of their exposure, which would then trigger a cascade of you know, manual contact tracing, phone calls and resource coordination, et cetera. But it would be entirely at the, uh, at the consent of the individual who's been alerted on their phone that they've been exposed. Whether that works or not, we'll have to see. Okay. Um, so how can these uh, privacy measures uh, for contact tracing be explained to the public in a way that builds trust? And I, I just want to say I was on Twitter a couple of days ago and, and somebody is running a, starting a pilot program on uh, um, app uh, contact tracing. And I looked at all the comments and they were all, not me, no way. I don't want the government to have any of my information. So how do we get the, the, the word out about the effort that's made, um, that has been made to make sure that uh, privacy is uh, preserved? Yeah, Brandy, do you want to take that one? And I can maybe chime in later. Yeah, um, I think, you know, first and foremost, the information should be coming from a reputable resource and, and hopefully it is because the entities deploying these technologies are, of course, you know, for the most part, reputable institutions. Um, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done on informing the public on how the technology works. So there, there should be education campaigns and, of course, uh, education on how, how are you ensuring that data is maintained in a way that is privacy preserving. So I, I think there's a very important education component to this to mitigate some of those fears and reluctance of individuals, because as we've noted, in order for these digital technologies to work, you do need to deploy them at, at scale, at a larger scale to get um, you know, a tipping point of users. Dan, do you have more? Yeah, there's, and there's actually, so the education point I think is, uh, is really important. Um, this technology is actually not that difficult to understand. It doesn't. It doesn't use very complicated, um, um, uh, you know, gears and levers. It's actually something that you can. I think anyone can kind of uh, wrap their heads around. It's just my phone is sending an identifier to your phone, and if I get infected, I, you know, your phone is tell. It will tell you that you received that it received an identifier that was marked as um, positively tested. That that's basically it. There are a couple of YouTube videos that have been made to explain the technology to um, to the public. Uh, maybe I'll share a link to some of those. Um, so th those are actually quite quite clear. Um, and um, well, and beyond that, um, uh, what can I say? Yeah, I, I think I totally agree. It's education and the fact that these messages are coming from reputable sources is is the answer. And I would just add, I think we need you know we need to have research evidence that shows that it works, right? That we can show to the general public, you know, this has worked in Arizona, you know, people's, you know, uh, privacy was not undermined, um, you know, issues of health equity were not undermined um, and it enabled us to do the work more efficiently than the manual contact tracing. And if we don't have that data, I don't know that we should be doing this at scale. It's a very good point, yes. Uh all right, uh, from Stanley, he wants to know, um, does the Bluetooth information include the duration of exposure? For example, uh, whether you just pass someone on the sidewalk or you were sitting next to somebody uh, for more than an hour. Yeah, no, again, that's an excellent question. So your, your phone is basically sending out these identifiers uh, a couple times a second. And as a result, uh, whoever's receiving these notifications, these, whoever's, whoever's receiving the identifiers uh, can basically tell how long they've been uh, sitting next to you. Uh, so in fact, when you get when you get an exposure notification, you you can actually uh, tell your phone can tell, oh, this was as a this was a result of a two hour exposure or this was a result of a five minute exposure. Yeah, again, there's a granularity to which this information is is revealed is shown to the user, but the phone will actually know what the um, what the duration of the exposure was. Again, the phone doesn't know whether you were wearing masks or you know, how exactly how close you were to one another. So there's a lot of inaccuracy 
in the information. It's very important to understand there's a lot of inaccuracy, um, but at least some things can be told like when the exposure happened and how long it actually uh, was for. Okay. Um, and can we, what, what can we learn about um, the uh, experience of these uh, app-based contact tracers from other states or countries? You spoke about Singapore. Are there um, other examples also? Um, go ahead, Mike. Uh, no, well, I would just say that there are, there are other places that are using apps and Dan may have a better sense for this than me, but I would just, I would urge caution, you know, we're not comparing apples to apples. For example, in Singapore, their, their public health response is, is huge. You know, they have several thousand people doing manual contact tracing. And then they're also leveraging all sorts of other uh, surveillance technologies to enhance the, the work of manual contact tracing. So the app plays a role, but it's not the only thing they're doing. And similarly, I think, you know, places in Asia have embraced for want of a better term, virtual, virtuous surveillance, you know, and, and it, that's sort of an accepted part of, of daily life in a way that wouldn't necessarily be applicable here. But Dan, maybe you could speak to examples from elsewhere in, in Europe. Oh yeah, for sure, sure. Um, yeah. So it's, it's quite interesting actually. For example, in, uh, in, um, in, the, in, in Korea, they uh, were concerned about not everyone having phones. And so they actually came up with a hardware token that people can put on their keychains um, that would actually function basically in the same way as a, as a phone as far as uh, exposure not notification. Um, then in, uh, in Europe, of course, in Germany and Switzerland, this, th these, these applications, these apps have been uh, adopted actually uh, quite well. It's, it's very interesting actually that a lot of the um, adoption also happens because of word of mouth. For example, I have a, a friend who's in Germany right now and he just told me that he, he was just notified and as a result, he, he went and got tested. That kind of word of mouth story definitely gets people to, um, to kind of use the technology more. Um, yeah, and then it's, it's been used in, in the, so, so Europe and Asia are, um, have embraced this, like, like Mike said, uh, to a great, much greater de degree than here. Um, and so time will tell and we'll see what happens here. All right, and I think this is our um, last question from Mariana. Can you go more in depth about um, specifically what is being done to coordinate between the apps and manual contact tracing? I, I don't think much is being done right now to coordinate the, the apps and manual contact tracing. I, I, you know, partly because we're still trying to stand up the, the, you know, the, the infrastructure to, do, to use these applications. But how they interface with the Department of Public Health has not been figured out. And it's something that you know, causes some consternation here in San Francisco, for sure. Well, I guess, should they be, is uh, the question, should there be that uh, coordination going on? Oh, I mean, I think so, for sure. Like, you know, if we want people to be success, I mean, the, the, the ultimate goal of exposure notification is that we, we help people to be successful in fulfilling their obligations to our broader community, you know, to prevent the spread of COVID, right? And, and the Department of Public Health is, is, is there to support people to fulfill those obligations, to provide for their resource needs so that they can stay at home for 14 days. Um, so in my mind, absolutely, the two should be coordinated. And, and then there's the surveillance piece of it. You know, do we really know that contacts are actually quarantining if, if they should do based on exposure? You know, that information should be communicated to the Department of Public Health so they can surveil whether it, it's working at a sort of a population level. But as I said, I don't think that coordination has happened to date, but is the sort of, we'll need to if this is going to be successful. All right. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add in the last minute or so. I just have one last final um, thought. This pandemic is opening up, you know, this rationale behind greater surveillance for public health. But there is this other concern that I have of, you know, increasing surveillance that could cause harm down the road. Well, right now we might have really exceptional reasons for doing it for these public health gains we're kind of falling into that issue of what Woodrow Hartzog uh, says is surveillance inertia. Just like with the Patriot Act of ensuring national security, we implemented surveillance programs that had greater negative spillover effects in long term. And so my only caution and concern is let's, of course, to the best of our ability, address this pressing issue, but make sure that we are holding um, privacy and security to the highest regard. Yeah, that's a great point, Brandy. And if I could just build on that, I, you know, I, I think the opportunity that sits in front of us is to invest in public health 
to infrastructure to serve you know those folks that are most impacted by COVID and generally most impacted by a myriad of health inequities. And I think there's this sense that maybe an exposure notification application is the silver bullet that can help us end the pandemic, where really we should be investing in you know, addressing the socioeconomic determinants of health more generally. And, and sort of, you know, the epi speaks to this. The, we know that 80% of transmission is happening in households right now. Uh, an app isn't going to help you reach households. Contact traces are going to reach help you reach households. For sure, there's there's going to be value for the 20% of transmission that's happening out in, in, you know, in workplaces and others. But really, we should be investing our resources in public health infrastructure at this moment. Yeah, these Absolutely are all great agree. points. Maybe I'll, just, maybe I'll just say one last thing, which is that um, whatever gets deployed, we always need to worry about how uh, adversaries might abuse the system. And this need, whatever uh, legislation or policies are enacted, they always have to, they, they, they should also discuss how to mitigate um, yeah, abuse that uh, no harm can, can come from the system. So, totally agree. All right. Well, I, I'm afraid our time is up and uh, the three of you have really been fabulous today. I'm sorry that we didn't get to um, that we didn't get to all our questions. I'm also sorry that I didn't have the bandwidth to have my uh, video on the whole time. But I want to thank uh, the three of you and I want to thank everybody else that joined us today. Uh, if you have any follow up questions, please reach out to our experts or CCST and I will move it over to Amber to close. Thank you, Assemblywoman Irwin. I want to echo your thanks and huge thanks to you too as our expert moderator. I'd also like to thank our CCST team who made this possible today. I learned a lot, so I am grateful for that. I hope everyone who joined us learned as well. And I, uh, I hope that uh, those of you who are have joined can also give your feedback on how we can make these briefings better for you and you can share topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. We think and hope that our next briefing will be on blue carbon. I hope also that we may have some blue skies to see when we have our next briefing and we appreciate, appreciate everybody joining us today. Please stay tuned and stay safe. Have a good afternoon.